All right. Thank you, Taylor. It's good to be here. Uh, for COVID conferences, this is my first second. So this is the, the second year being virtual. And I, I do miss connecting with everyone in person, but I'm so thankful uh, for ASK for getting us together to exchange ideas. And in my work with API companies at every developer, I get to see the power of specs every day. And going back uh, to my time at Programmable Web during the wild wests of APIs, uh, I think we've seen that specs have now solved a lot of problems that we used to have and maybe created a few other new ones too that we can uh, dive into. As, as Taylor mentioned, most of the time these conversations are around the tools. We generate docs, we generate SDKs, and I'm sure we'll talk about some of that, but uh, this panel is an attempt to go beyond that. And we have a great group to do that. Uh, as Taylor mentioned, kind of across uh, across what an organization would have touching specs. And so I'm gonna, uh, delighted to introduce uh, uh, Shekhar uh, Banerjee, uh, the member of the virtual architecture team and public API governance at eBay. Uh, Jennifer Rondo, a technical tech writer. <laughs> You'll have to tell us about that. Write the docs organizer, principal tech writer at Kong. Uh, and occasional API spec contributor, and Kin Lane, API evangelist, conference organizer, and chief evangelist at Postman. So panel, welcome. Uh, Shekhar, I thought we could start by asking like, so you come from this, this engineering perspective on specs. Does an engineer get anything from API specs beyond tools? Yeah, so here's how I see it. Um, a rich specification for any ecosystem, not just APIs, lends structure, integrity, and standardized means of communication. The collaboration becomes easy as a direct consequence of that. The tooling system, the much talked about tooling ecosystem is finally concrete, standardized, and unified to build awesome capabilities on. Now the contribution of the feature rich specification to the tooling open, uh, tooling universe, open source or otherwise, is often understated, but it is that what lends the foundation, lays the foundation for the work, for the awesome work that we've seen in, with uh, open API tooling, with async API tooling uh, to, to come together. And right. if, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Yeah. And, and if I give, need to give a more specific answer, as an API capability developer, let's say I, I need a standardized way to express express uh, or, uh, capabilities that I'm developing in a very standardized but simple structure such that it helps answer almost all questions a potential integrator may have. So, so that to me is the real power of a specification. All right, and, and we're gonna dig into a bunch of that, I think. Jennifer, I wanna go to you real quick with kind of the top line, how do tech writers work with API specs? Well, the, the starter answer is the tech writer's answer to every question. It depends, <laughs> it, but it really does. Um, it really depends on what the organization um, is doing with the API. Um, it depends on the relationship between a docs team, if there is one, um, and the engineering team. Um, I myself have worked at the design level on specs um, as part of a governance team. Um, I've poked my fingers into design because if it's hard to document, maybe the solution isn't in the documentation, right? Um, and I've poked around in code annotations, simply helping produce this spec from code. But um, that's my experience. It turns out that write the docs folks do a lot of different things. Some tech writers write the spec by hand for the sole purpose of producing the documentation. They are the sole owners of it. It otherwise does not have anything to do with what happens code-wise. Um, and that's actually more common than you might think. Um, I was a little shocked to discover this. A fellow documentarian actually posted the question 
to the right the duck slack literally last Thursday. So I'm relying on the 20 some odd answers to his question. Um, but um, the, the, the marginally dominant model is writers work um, primarily on the descriptions, whether it's in the spec with engineers or architects, or whether it's in the code um, because you're generating the spec. Um, but it's really all over the map. Um, and depending again on the company, my experience is the sky's the limit in terms of how much poking around in spec related stuff a tech writer wants to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that writing the spec just to just to generate the docs might get to a little bit of that misconception that it is only the tools that uh, that uh, is a reason for having a spec. Now, Ken, from what you get to see and uh, you have the breaking changes uh, thing behind you, I know you've talked to a bunch of uh, execs in uh, in various companies what like what does someone who is not in engineering or tech writing get out of out of a spec i mean i guess it's not the tools yeah it's i mean i think docs and code gener are definitely the most visible tangible forms that that i think we've all experienced but leadership's not going to care i mean documentation great it's a pain point we need it but from from a strategy high level i'm going to build on what shecker said about standardizing communication and and it's really it's it's how you achieve team alignment it's how you get your teams on the same page communicating when one says here's what i mean by this api here's what they mean the spec defines that and so it's how you get that team alignment and it's how you get that that momentum that velocity and everything that you want from leadership you know when it comes to you know looking at your fat api factory floor and your, your, your Ford, you know, uh, 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 supply chain, like how you deliver the technology that you're going to need to deliver, having consistent, uh, well-designed API specs that look that, that ensure your APIs look the same act, have the same behaviors, uh, no matter what team it came from is critical to, to your business. And otherwise, you're always going to be encountering friction. You're always going to be have have problems with velocity, and change is going to trip you up. And these are all things that you know keep leadership up at night. They're going to want they want to optimize, and and specs are key to that. So uh, I know spec is in the name of the conference, but based on based on what you just said, I mean, can we really say that leadership care about the specs themselves? No, nobody cares about the specs except for maybe me. Um, and everyone who's just attending in, in this conference. <laughs> they, they, I'm sorry, I don't mean to burst everyone's bubble. No, I mean, it, they, they care in the sense that, you know, uh, the outcomes that, that the specs enable. They're not, no one's going to get, I mean, not no one, everyone here, the, the 300 people attending this conference really care about specs. And that's, and, and that's super critical and important. But leadership needs to know about them, needs to understand that they exist, why they matter. Uh, but they're not going to—they're—they're they're unlikely to get their hands, you know, dirty down in the weeds. But you know, they're aware of business contracts. These are these are just digital contracts, and so uh, they need to understand how they work, the impact that they align their teams and 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 they help them at, at an overall strategic vantage point. But uh, they're not, you know, they're not going to care. It's a config file for your operations is how they're going to see it. They're, it's a config file for their business. But if someone listening to this who does care a lot about specs knows they need to communicate that, it sounds like it's talk about not the, the spec itself, but the outcomes. And one of the things, Shekhar, you said when you... Uh, we're saying why they're important to you beyond tools is uh, being able to see the, the capabilities, I think is how, how you phrased it. How, how does that, how do you see that uh, coming through in a spec? Yeah, so as, as a member of the, also the governance uh, that we have in place for APIs, it having an unified way of expressing anything has, has benefits. And in this case, we're talking about very powerful specifications. Open API, for example, it was designed to express APIs using purely HTTP semantics. 
And, and it's done an awesome job of it. Given an API contract, I know immediately as an integrator that, okay, here are the HTTP status codes that I care about. Here are the different response request structures. Here are the, any other, here are the descriptions of what constitutes those request response structures in terms of field definitions. So pretty much it tells me anything that I need to do. Async API is, it deals with a lot more complexity than that because of all these different protocols and bindings come into play. But however, that also gives structure to an extremely complex, even driven ecosystems tend to be extremely complex. Now having it laid out in a structured unified manner has long reaching benefits. It, 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 it primarily the collaboration aspect of it, understanding all the even streams at play within the system, understanding different, different uh, operations that you have, understanding the security protocols for, for either open API or async API. So, so specifications help put everything together in the simplest, most comprehensive manner possible. Jennifer or Ken, are there other things that you see uh, as far as exposing capabilities? I'm actually thinking about something slightly different, but very much related to, to what Shekhar just said, which um, sounds like a kind of idealized vision of what specs can help us with. But how do we make it happen in the real world where organizations are messy and teams are distributed and inevitably having to adapt to a lot of rapid change, changing markets, right? I mean, Ken talked about why leadership should care about specs, but specs are also a way of responding to changing markets, right? Um, I, won't name any famous APIs here, but I mean, because we're also talking primarily here about internal APIs, right? I mean, there are APIs that are very famous externally facing products. Um, and, but, but even setting that aside, you know, that changing markets are gonna change sort of product direction or can't have the potential to change internal things. There's a whole lot of, I mean, I tend to think of, I mean, the point behind APIs is to make it easier to integrate with complex systems. You expose, you know, so you get, they're, they're a bit of a black box. Um, and that's the point, right? But the more we move into a microservices driven architecture, the more black boxes there are, we need those specs, but there's a lot of stuff going on inside the black box that might not play quite so nice with the spec. And yes, I like to complicate things, but what do we do about this? I mean, like, I guess a question for Shikhar is, can a spec help? Sorry, I'm really in love with Conway's law lately. If you've got a really loosely coupled organization and a really loosely coupled set of, oh, let's call them boundaries that you're trying to sort of design APIs and write specs against. How can the spec help corral some of that? Yeah, I'm a big fan of specifications. So, Listen, um, I love it. I love it. I, I, I love it. I, 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 want, I want an answer to this question. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, so here's how I think it helps manage the chaos. First of all, it help, uh, specifications gives a way of having uniform taxonomy and expressing any capabilities. And that itself, allows for governance, standardized governance across APIs that allows for, uh, essentially when we talk about capabilities, programmable entities that are being developed by these different parts of the orgs, it is about understanding what, un not really the implementation behind it, but understanding the interfaces that is of concern to me. Now, I don't, for example, if I'm integrating with an API from, a, let's say eBay, I don't care whether they're pushing the data to Oracle or some other data store or whatever. I care about how is my integration pattern with eBay defined. And in terms of that, and, and just reducing that to organizational boundaries, it is how, it is just having a standardized language to communicate, a standardized way to govern things, a standardized ways to maybe create an apps asset repository, maybe have reusability of common shared components and libraries, in this case, definitions. So, so it helps in those ways 
uh, to me. I hope and, that answered your question. And and uh, Shekhar, you you mentioned managing the chaos. I think anyone who uh, who is listening here and is looking for their next title, chaos manager, is a is a good possibility for if you're dealing with uh, all of the specs across your organization. So one of the one of the things that that companies do to be able to organize all of these different APIs and hopefully the specs around them is they say, oh, we have a, we have a governance program and uh, new things have to go through here. And we have some way of looking at our, at our old ones. And there we've solved the chaos uh, with the, the big G word. What, uh, what do you all think? Is that, have we solved it? We could end early if we, if we solved it. No. <laughs> The specs definitely go a long ways to, to helping us make, make sense of this chaos and, and define it. But we have to think about, it's not just the spec itself. It's, it's all the work that goes into the spec. So it's, it's not just open API. It's the fact that Daryl Miller and Marsh, who have opinions, went into that spec over years. And Ron, I'll, I'll, I'll throw Ron in there too. Is, and so all this wealth of knowledge over time accumulates into these specs. You got, you got Fran Mendez and, and the whole community going into async APS. So all that knowledge and awareness goes into the spec. So when you apply that spec as, at a team level, you absorb that. You have to work within that framework and scaffolding. And sometimes you, when you approach, when I talk to API providers or enterprise, they're like, well, you know, we tried to describe our APIs with open API and we just couldn't do it. And I'm like, well, how, why, how much is that you, how much is that, is it the spec it, or is it some other, you know? And so we have to conform and shape ourselves and how we, we do APIs. And then as Shekhar said, you know, it, it's, it's how we communicate and get on the same page. It also shapes and makes teams consistent. So at, back, bring it back up to leadership, thinking from a leadership level is, you look across 500 developers across your enterprise organizations, the ones that are using open API or async API have done the homework, have done the details to think consistently in standardized ways about how they're designing, developing, operating, and then documenting, generating code and testing their APIs. So, so evidence of the spec that's, that's, you've done your homework, you, 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 and then the longer you've done it, the more experience, the more knowledge of these standards that are baked into these specs that you have. So think of it like hiring people from, you know, uh, for your company that went to university, you're not necessarily going for the degree you're going because they're probably better organized. They probably know how to take notes. They probably know how to work well with other people. There's all these other skills that go into why you hire someone who went to a university. Um, I did not graduate from university, full disclosure. Um, but uh, so, so leadership wise, when you're looking at teams across, you know, you know that everything's gone into it's 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 a certain quality assurance just to to know that your teams are standardizing and doing their homework and operating in a similar fashion. Anyone else uh, see a way that specs play a role in in governance and organizations? I'll bite. Jennifer, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, the pro so my experience with governance is is about you know, sort of API review, um, and in addition to that consistency that we're talking about, this is slightly further sort of down the layer of abstraction, but um, you know, sort of solid design. Um, you know, I mean, review as part of governance can really help with that. Um, as at least in my experience, when teams are still new to the idea of even exposing an API and describing it with Swagger or Open API, I mean, I go back to Swagger, right? Um, is it, sometimes, sometimes they're new, and I, I think this is still true from the stories that I hear. You know, I know things have come a long way, and yes, there was more chaos back in the day, but I think there's still chaos. Um, with a lowercase c and a lot of, okay, how do we do this thing? Um, 
And, and governance can really help um, sort of train people up and coach. Um, and, and also with an eye to usability. I mean, in, where I've tended to poke my fingers into API design review is, is around naming, right? Um, because it's real easy to just say, okay, I'm going to take this unintelligible function name and dump it wholesale into a, and as a parameter name. And you still like, you know, you've 27 characters later, you're still struggling to parse this string. And what is this supposed to mean? Um, and um, I mean, that's only one example. You know, there's, there's all kinds of sort of entity relationships um, and complexity. Um, in API design that review and governance can also really help sort of train people to think about because the spec is operating at a different level possibly from what they've been used to thinking about when they're sort of designing their bits of the code. Yeah, yeah, I, I co-hosted a handful of podcast episodes with Stoplight uh, and that was one of the things that came up, up over and over is sort of this idea of naming things that, I mean, because technically you could put anything into the endpoint, right? I mean, it doesn't have to be a name that means anything, just a sequence of, uh, of characters, right? So, uh, Shekhar, maybe thinking of eBay APIs, which I know go beyond uh, public APIs. I mean, how much of a conversation around what we call things and who's in that conversation. So uh, we have a governance uh, uh, committee that reviews specifically for external facing um, interfaces. We have a lot more scrutiny in place simply because with internal teams, you still have the flexibility of the teams communicating and perhaps making backward incompatible changes as long as they're aligned with each other. But when you learn something externally, it needs to be more robust. It needs to be future friendly. It also needs to have consistency across domains. Now, eBay is a complex use case. We have buying, selling, different all kinds of users, things. We have reporting metrics. So we, we have a honeycomb with, I'm not sure of the number, but probably more than 400 endpoints in that. But, but here's the thing. But as far as common definitions are concerned, maybe I'm from, let's say, logistics team, and there is already a definition that's uh, and I let's say I have standardized in a definition for expressing logistics um, uh, things like ship, shipping information. Now, we won't want, for example, a different experience, a checkout experience to create a completely different representation of the same exact component, say an address component, for example, a tracking component. So that's where these governance committees that actually have representation from across the world play a part because they are deeply aware of what exists and they harness that knowledge into this community. And the idea is not really to govern, but to facilitate reusability and consistency across APIs, which is also governance, but yeah. And so when you say like the, uh, the logistics, you know, the, the, the shipping, I mean, is, is there someone already on that committee that, uh, that is from, that has that knowledge or, or is there, are there, moments there where there's this API is goes deep into an area that maybe the committee doesn't have, but needs to pull yeah. in that knowledge. Yes, yes. And that is exactly why we have this overarching uh, committee with members from different aspects of different organizations, from shipping, from search, from uh, data, uh, from various, uh, various, from buying experience, from the selling experience. The reason we have this committee with all these overarching members is because no individual could have Tremendous knowledge. Actually, my mentor, Inibe Tanya Vlahovic, she does have, <laughs> single-handedly has information across her portfolio. But apart from her, I mean, it's it's virtually impossible for one person. And then we have people coming in and out of the orgs at all time. So there's no way an API designer could just come in and come up with the perfect design that's consistent across every single domain. And that is where of course, uh, again, specifications plays a big part there because you can standardize some of the common definitions and have simply external references pointing to those or just to have a pointer, have an asset library that people can refer to. And specifications allows for uh, uh, an arrangement of that sort. But beyond that automation side, when it comes to intuitive, we, we have been greatly benefited by this 
by this committee that provides insights into and enables individual teams at domains. And they, it's not expected that, let's say you've just joined, you're part of the shipping team, for example, or let's say some other team, and, um, and uh, you're, you're making a proposal for an external API. You, it's expected that you may not know all the standards and all the different existing definitions and all that. You just joined. I mean, it's not even expected. Yeah, that's where the committee is expected to give feedback then, all right, let's design this with you. And here's what you could reuse. And here's how we could have consistency across our portfolio, not specific to the selling use case or buying use case, but across the board. And that is only possible through this governance committee, but specifications empower that. Yeah, and now I, I'm picturing the Jedi Council. And so don't, uh, uh, don't, burst my bubble and say that it doesn't actually look like that with Yoda and the like all uh, all sitting around there. I, no, I'm, curious, uh, <laughs> I'm curious, I'm uh, curious what the makeup of that is, but I wonder, Jennifer, if you've seen those sorts of committees together and what role a tech writer could play if they, whether they do or not, what role they could play in, in that group? Well, I think I sort of referred, I mean, Catching naming things is a big one, right? If it involves words, right? Tech writers can generally help. Even tech writers who weren't as likely to sort of poke their fingers into everything as I am, right? I mean, you put words in front of a tech writer and they're gonna like point out that maybe you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means, um, which you know goes for what you name, um, you know, all of the things technical term thing um, in your API. Um, and, and then again, too, you know, technical writers are also information architects, right? So if you're, I'm, I'm sorry, this is at a very high level of abstraction at the moment, I'm not thinking of a good example, um, but if you're, for example, if you've got a chained set of calls your client needs to make um, and you haven't thought through what the sequence of endpoints and operations ought to be, because you're basically starting from scratch, exposing some stuff that you haven't had to really think API-wise about before. Um, if that, it, I've seen APIs that basically wind up, have the potential to wind up in loops and writers can catch that kind of thing. You don't have to know how to write a client library or no library to understand that, um, it, if I try to explain how these, how, for example, this response field gets passed to uh, a get in another call and, and like, I can't make head or tail of it. Again, maybe the answer isn't in the documentation, it's in the design. So I think on both those levels, um, just sort of organizationally and naming things are both things that writers can contribute to. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, so, so in this committee that I mentioned, we do have technical writer representation and we've been tremendously benefited by their inputs. That's great. Yeah, and uh, I definitely, uh, as a writer, uh, <laughs> have, that, have that bias for sure as well. But if you look at at least an open API document and you sort of just visually highlight the areas that actually are meant to have human written, human readable words, it's a good portion of the, of the document, right? Oh yeah, I mean, and that's really, really important. I've already mentioned, you know, there are folks, you know, there, there's documentation sets that have you know, for APIs that have never been touched by anybody except the technical writer, because they write the whole thing, yeah. largely for the purpose of creating those descriptions. Right. I mean, you right. need everything else that goes into it as well, but the description is the key piece that explains the stuff. Yeah, but it sounds like if someone makes that afterwards, then then the organization has missed out on the input at those earlier levels around naming or around other issues. Thousand percent, yes. Yeah. Uh, Ken, in the conversations you've had with companies that have their own Jedi Council, uh, what are the roles that you see frequently uh, on on those group in those groups? Yeah, the the 
the way governance is played, it plays out in different organizations can, can vary. It can be more top down center of excellence, uh, architects leading the conversation um, with a heavy, you know, business influence there and then disseminating down. I've seen versions that are more bottom up and product managers and champions from each, each squad team, whatever, uh, contributes and, and, it, and it trickles up as well as back down to, to these groups. But I think uh, that representation of business leadership, architectural leadership is pretty key. Uh, you know, you need those domain experts there bringing, uh, bringing the, the knowledge and, and the words and phrases. Um, but then you also need, you need that lower level participation and ownership. Like these folks have to uh, have a voice, have a say. It can't just be trickled down. And I liked uh, Shecker's kind of stumbling on what is governance. And I'm, I've always been a big proponent of like, we need a new word for governance. But I've learned over the, the, the years that governance has a lot of meaning and, and, and use, tends to be more to the upper levels. Um, and uh, I did a, a show with a, a fellow named John Musser the, uh, a couple weeks back. You might know him, Adam. Uh, I'll John have to Musser. write that down. Yeah. Um, founder of programmable web yeah yeah you should meet him he's really a good guy um but he used the phrase uh he says instead of governance you know call it enablement and because it's really what what we're trying to do across teams is just enable them you know to use the right words to use the right phrases you know enable the doc writers enable the the developers enable the the q a and testers and just enable people to do what they do best but on the same page, using the same vocabulary, and and I like what Tanya said in the in the chat uh, right now. It's a URI is like a sentence where HTTP methods are verbs and resources are nouns. It's as simple as that. And when you read the when you read as many document API docs as I do, like you you see the coherent ones really fast. You see people who are like, you know, and then some of them are just you know crud. Rah, rah crud, create, read, update, delete, you know, it's very, very, very basic. And then others are very nuanced. And you can tell when, when teams are working, you know, things are being orchestrated and, and we're working from a similar script and a similar vocabulary and, and um, it's really important. And so how we do gov we, governance is important, but, you know, I think we've got to acknowledge that, that there's different roles are, are required at different levels. And it's really a, about the people and those relationships, if it's going to be done well. Yeah. And you mentioned the chat and I want to encourage anyone who's watching this live to drop some questions in because in a few moments, uh, we'll be pulling from, from those. Uh, but first I get to keep asking the questions. And I want to shift slightly, but I'm going to guess maybe not so big of a shift and ask about API security. It's definitely a hot topic. Can specs help encourage? They can't, they can't make every API secure, but can they help encourage that? Yes. <laughs> and, and, and end of story. Well, I'll throw in, I mean, you can't secure what you don't know about. If you can't see APIs out there that exist, I mean, mo just about every organization I've gone into doesn't know where all their APIs are. So you can't tell me if you don't yeah. know where all your APIs are that your infrastructure and your apps are secure. And so just at a bottom line, specs provide us with the map to that universe, but specs themselves are not gonna secure anything. It comes down to the tooling. It comes down comes down to the people, the knowledge, the domain experts. There's a lot more that goes into it. But this, but without the specs, it's going to be a lot more difficult. Yeah, I, I would say it's still um, specifications do play a part in security. Of course, your implementation could completely differ from what you specified as your security protocols in your specs. But however. It does, let's say you have fine-grained OAuth controls in, and when you're proposing an interface, you include your security access, let's say an API. You say, here are the OAuth um, scopes that I would require for this endpoint. And then it, it, the right councils, InfoSec and other folks can decide whether that scope is appropriate for the data being exposed or flowing through that, those APIs. 
So yes, it could. You need additional tooling on top of that to verify that the implementation does match the interface definition. But the interface definition still allows you to um, unambiguously specify any security constraints that may be involved. Well, and that comes back to Ken's earlier point about, you know, sort of at the business level and, you know, API is contract. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of implicit promise that you're going to pay attention to these things that you really better pay attention to. Of course, you know, I mean, I really do love Ken's answer best. <laughs> if you don't even know where they are, they're not secure. <laughs> because if you're not paying attention to security, it's not secure. That you're, if you're paying attention, it still might not be secure, but that's step number one, right? And when we were all chatting last week, you know, I made the point um, that in addition to, um, you know, sort of, first of all, knowing where your APIs are, secondly, sort of working with a spec, thirdly, you know, sort of adding security protocols to the spec. Um, you're really not going to be able to do anything about those without docs that the spec can't completely provide. Um, I've yet to meet a developer new to an API who didn't stumble over and really badly need their hand held um, around OAuth, for example. Um, I mean, especially if you're going to be as thoughtful um, as Sekhar just described in terms of scopes and def defining those very specifically, right? Um, I mean, it's, um, I could say lots more on that, but I won't. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, we've started to get some questions and uh, I'm, I'm curious who our uh, OWASP expert is here on on this call. Uh, the first question is, do the API specs include data or responses to the OWASP uh, top 10? I, I can speak to that. Yeah. Um, so open API and async API, you can have examples, multiple examples, and those examples can be customized. But uh, the these specs that act as the source of truth, um, we're, we're spending a lot of time in investing, trying to make them do, do more than they should. They're, they're meant to describe, you know, what is possible of reference documentation of, of, of that entire surface area. And this I'll throw in, it's, it's open source. Um, it's, a, it's a widely adopted spec, but it's not moved forward with a, a governance like OpenAPI and Async API, but the, the Postman collection is very much a, a spec that is a derivative from that open API. And there are uh, quite a few, if you, in the Postman API network, there's quite a few collections that are dedicated to the OWASP top 10 and actually have the data and have those use cases. Um, so, so it's already in, a, in an executable unit that you can then put in the URL of any API and execute that OWASP top 10 across it. So it's, it's, it's a spec, but it's also adjacent to the spec when, when it comes to applying it. But yeah, that's, that's very much the goal of, of kind of evolving beyond just testing, spec-driven testing, um, but also, and then we, you can also use specs to, to, to govern and do some of the governance stuff we talked about, but this is specifically in the serve using the truth, but then a secondary spec, the collection to then execute the OWASP top 10 against that truth and then validate it as thumbs up or thumbs down either manually or in an automated way, um, via pipeline. And that's the, it's open web application security projects. Uh, and hopefully someone, or maybe that question for those watching live uh, has this link to the, uh, to the top 10 within it, uh, but it's, a, it's around like access control and injection and various other ways that something could happen badly to, to an API. Did someone else, sorry, I wanted to make sure someone else had something to say on that question. No. Uh, so the second question, uh, so sometimes senior management 
believes their role is to do governance. So this maybe comes to to that uh, situation where where leadership does care, but they care maybe with uh, with a heavy hand. Uh, but then their their eyes gl glaze over the question says at the thought of looking at an open API spec. So they they want to do it, but then they don't want to be in the weeds. How, how do you how do you handle that? Doesn't seem like that connects. But how do you uh, how do you handle that situation? Um, I can take that if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my view is that uh, depending on who the senior management folks are, so uh, it's again putting the right folks to do the right job. If the senior uh, the senior management also defines folks who are uh, who are uh, not just on the executive side of management, but however, if they're the executive chain, their responsibility is more to make sure that the right people are in place for executing to their vision, yes? So it's not that we expect a CEO of a company or many companies to sit and start looking at API contracts or specs. No, no this is not even specs, anything to do it, but they would drive the high level vision and they would have experts, expert developers, expert um, governance committee folks, ex expert technical writers to bring that to the outside world if it's external facing. But their job is not really, I mean, I wouldn't really expect a CEO, CTO of a company to even have the bandwidth to sit and start looking at contracts of every single API being expressed. And so what do you think, uh, this, is, this could be for anyone, what do you think it is that what outcome? Going back to the the outcome, not the not the tools. What outcome do you think someone's looking for when they want to do governance? What what do they really what do they really want there? Uh, Quality, reliability, agility. They want to move fast. They want. They want to not be tripped up by change. So governance is going to speak to all of those, those business outcomes that matter. Uh, you're, going to, you're going to hear a lot less about problems. You're going to hear a lot less about outages, failures, complaints from customers, yeah. uh, performance issues, things like that. So in the, in the situations where this comes up, I think it sounds like it might be uh, having that translator that layer between, you know, a, a human between that spec, like just giving the spec isn't the answer. It's how can, how can you convert that into, uh, into those benefits, Ken, that you just mentioned? Is that? Yeah. And, and to bring it down to the tooling level, I mean, dashboards, reports, mm -hmm. you know, you should, the, the a instances of the API should have dashboard and reports that check their tests performance, availability, security, but then in aggregate your operations. So your teams, the APIs in aggregate across your teams, across your lines of business should have reports and dashboards that show, you know, are they meeting, you know, what's their uptime and availability, security, performance, and then governance. And so there should be observability across all of that. That'll be all spec driven. And that's what is going to matter to leadership. They're going to look at that they're going to see the colors, see the, the patterns that they're, you know, they were trained in, you know, when they first started looking at to, to notice, they're going to see the good and the bad, and, and they're going to glance at that. And that's, that's all that's going to matter. Um, and, and so it so sounds like there maybe is some tools there, but there's a human to decide what is important that, that we're exposing there. Um, and I just the, want to uh, do a really yeah, strong yeah, yeah. Like plus, plus 10 to that observability part. Um, that is all. So we talked, we talked about governance for a bit. Um, there we go. So we talked about governance and someone said, why now? Why now uh, is governance important? Is it newly important? <laughs> I, I mean, maybe. I, I mean, maybe it is. It in my world, it's not. It's something I've been aware of for ten years, maybe. 
I mean, fledgling maybe 10 years ago, um, but maybe more people are paying more attention. I think as, okay, I'm going to go way, way abstract here, but, um, you know, as cloud native gets a, to be a bigger and bigger thing, as microservices architecture is something that people think a lot more about. So you really have to think about how all the small pieces fit together better. Um, something's got to replace that monolith and it can't just be a whole lot of random little microservices floating around in the cloud. Okay, that's hyperbole there. Y'all know, I go here. Um, but really governance is what helps bring, it sort of helps make sense out of decomposing the monolith. Um, and because we haven't been talking about that aspect of it, right? We've really been talking about sort of the spec side of things, but at a, at a higher level, because I've been kind of working on more, less on the API spec side of things and more on the, what I call distributed deployment side of things, which is APIs, not even under the hood, right? Um, it's like, there's a lot more of that. I mean, I've seen crazy examples of it where there was a perfectly adequate monolith that should never have been decomposed in the first place, but you know, like people are getting on the microservices bandwagon. So let's like, go for APIs. You need something to pull that all together. So I think people are paying a lot more attention at that level. And I'm sure other folks who are more down in the weeds than I am with this stuff have more to say. Yeah, I'll, I'll pile on with, with, you know, we're using more SaaS services. We're, you know, we're composing our, our enterprise organizations. Um, you know, uh, we have just a lot more APIs and mainstream companies, you know, starting in 2016, 17, you know, I'm, I've been talking to just mainstream insurance companies, banks, healthcare, you know, all of this. So everybody's doing APIs. There's more APIs, microservices, internal, external and it's becoming a problem. Turtles all the way down, I call it. <laughs> yep. So uh, there were a bunch of other questions that, uh, that we weren't able to get to live here. Uh, I hope if there are others who are within there, you could kind of have that conversation in chat uh, or in, um, in time, uh, time that you're interacting on maybe some of those open uh, discussions. I want to close, though, with uh, one of the questions we did get, which is, looking forward now, what are the biggest weaknesses in this current state that we haven't solved yet? So what, what are we going to try to tackle next with this, these specs? Spec-driven education and enablement and training. Someone needs to be able to. So the next gen of docs. So make it so I can learn about an API or a workflow built on multiple APIs using an automated educational training system that's spec driven and always up to date. All right. Jennifer. I'd still add a human element to that. <laughs> Have the human Always. connect the bits that then can be automated for the learning. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's along the lines, you know, in my, I didn't talk about my Zapier past, but being able to see the use cases within the APIs. And that's, uh, I think it's probably three years ago that I gave a talk about what's missing and being use cases. I would still love to, to see some of that. So I, I love that answer too. Uh, but maybe, maybe we have another uh, area of, of future fixing and weakness. Shekhar, why don't you close us out with what you think, where you think things are headed? I apologize, I'm on mute. Uh, I think that specifications, again, going back to the standardization um, aspect of it, allows for a lot of the enablement process, um, allows for a lot of this governance or enable process, I mean, process to be automated. Now you don't, I mean, if the really the goal is ensuring consistency across other definitions, that is something that we can code to. Functionally, whether an API should at all be released or not, and perhaps there are other drawbacks to release, releasing such a capability, that is human. 
That is where human intuition plays a part. But everything else, for the most part, a lot of the governance aspect in, in terms of ensuring specifically the consistency angle, specifically avoiding breaking changes from rolling out, specifically avoiding, like for example, you have contract A, contract B, contract A suddenly changed the security requirements that were specified in contract A. And, and then anybody integrating with contract, B, if contract B rolls out, there'll be a lot of applications that will break. Or maybe some parts have been removed. So understanding you now what constitutes a backward compatible change or not a backward compatible change is something that can be programmed. There are a lot of things. It allows for scripting. It allows for automating a lot of things. Yeah. And so, and what, what you've mentioned there is definitely tooling, but again, focusing on those outcomes that someone gets, the not having a broken API, yes. being able to have consistency, those sorts of outcomes. And all of us who are working every day with these specs, finding ways to be able to communicate that to others in our organization who maybe their eyes do gloss over on the spec, but we want to be able to, uh, to really uh, share what is possible with it. So thank you uh, to the panel, uh, Shekhar, Jennifer, Ken. Uh, it was a great conversation. And uh, back over to Taylor. Yeah, thank you so much. That was an awesome panel. Um, we're about to have a short break, uh, but first I just wanna thank all the panelists. Thank you for taking your time to do this. Um, short break and please visit sponsors if you have some time and um, see y'all in a bit. <laughs>